good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainable Mail Group's first symposium of 2024. Sustainable sustainability is yes. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustin, and I'm the executive director of the Sustainable Mail Group. Before I hand it over to our panelists, uh, I just want to get through some minor housekeeping for the event. Um, the event is scheduled from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. this afternoon. You can ask questions using the chat or the Q&A function at any point in time um, throughout the session, but we won't answer them till the last 10 minutes of the event. Um, the event is being recorded, and if you're unable to actually sit it, sit through it at the very end, um, you're welcome to go visit our YouTube channel, the links to which are provided in the chat right now. Um, you'll also be able to find all of our past events um, and if you want, don't want to miss any content, I recommend that you subscribe to the channel and also click on that bell icon. Um, that will provide you with reminders anytime we post something new. If you've liked what you see, um, please consider joining the Sustainable Mail Group. Um, at again, the link provided in the chat and become part of the community. It always helps to end up having the broadest possible spectrum of participants in these events. Um, this session is being made possible by one of our sponsors, that is Spicers. Um, stay tuned, um, in particular, because this is the first of several sessions we plan on hosting along these lines in the coming months. And so let me begin by asking Kristen DeMarkey from Spikers, Spicers to introduce herself and to introduce our panelists. Kristen? Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. So yeah, my name is Kristen DeMarkey. I am a business development consultant with Spicers. <clears throat> we are a lead leading distributor of commercial print and business papers, specialty products, graphic solutions, sign display equipment and materials, and packaging facility equipment and supplies. We have 18 locations across Canada. On the paper end, we are very fortunate to collaborate with, to collaborate with outstanding paper mill partners. And today we're excited to have the Minadnock team join us with one of their partners. Manadnock collaborated with Shamik Communications and executed an exceptional direct mail campaign during the pandemic, which proved to be immensely successful. We believe it's a valuable case study that deserves to be shared. And with that, we'll turn things over to the Manadnock team. Julie? Hi, sorry about that. Uh, I'm Julie Brannon, and I'm here to represent and to talk with you folks today from the side of Manadnock Paper Mills. We're a 205 year old paper mill. A paper and packaging mill, I should say, located in Bennington, New Hampshire. And we are here to uh, share some of our experiences and our journey with you and in support of Kristen and Spicers, who is one of our, actually our exclusive stocking partner for some of our 100% most consumer recycled grades up in Canada. Thank you. In Wales, um, um, yeah, there we go. I'm Stacy uh, Peluso Slaney, I'm Vice President. Uh, we help companies develop, deliver, and deploy measurable marketing campaigns. We're a family-owned business uh, located just north of Boston in Peabody, Massachusetts. We uh, have been in business for 70 years. Kristen and I are part of the third generation, and we have the fourth generation working here, too, as well. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Kristen Spanier. Uh, I lead the Sustainable Green Print Program here at Shaman. Would you like me to uh, put the deck up? <laughs> That'd be great. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, I'll start here on the lead of the deck. So this is a, a deck just for the purpose of our referencing today to give you guys a little bit of a depiction of the joint marketing, paper, and print, and mailing venture that we embarked upon with Shamit during the um, pandemic. And so the actual box on the right here is the final product that ended, that ended up being yielded from this campaign. And I'll let Shamit talk a little bit about their thought process behind the innovation of it. But that product was printed on one of our sustainable substrates. And this is a really good example today of how a printer, a paper mill, and in most cases, a merchant as well, typically come together um, to fulfill the needs of a customer. Stace, did you want to say something on the campaign? Uh, I, can, I can handle the adopters if that's okay. Sure. And then I'll go back into talking about Manadnock for the team here. Okay. So we'll get into the campaign in more depth as we go through the presentation. We're excited to share that. 
But a little bit about Shamit. Uh, Shamit was started in 1951 as a mom and pop print shop um, established by our grandparents who immigrated to the United States. Uh, they came from a generation of waste not want not and were sustainable before that term was even really common. So repurposing, reusing, and being sustainable was part of their everyday life, which extended into supporting their local communities. So in all the ways that our grandparents helped others in business and in life came down to one characteristic, they were kind. And that's how we came up with the term sustainability is kindness. Uh, we continued our grandparents' commitment to sustainability over the years, uh, but wanted to do a more transparent and accountable way to actually do that. So in 2019, Shamit became the first, and by the way, we're still the only, uh, sustainable green printing certified commercial printer in Massachusetts. So you'll hear the term throughout this presentation, SGP. And SGP stands for Sustainable Green Printing Partnership. And that's a nonprofit accreditation organization throughout the US and Canada that's specific to print manufacturers. So Shamit's really grown and diversified through the years from a mom and pop shop into a print organization that serves in support of global clientele with a variety of print services like direct mail. So at Shamit, we really strive to be a community uh, that our grandparents would take pride in. I think they'll be especially proud um, of this specific direct mail campaign. Thank you, Tristan. Um, right. Andrew, if, if you want to flip the slide, we can go into a little bit of the meat of it now that we've covered the background. So one of the things we wanted to talk to you about today was where sustainability meets quality or vice versa. At Manhattan, we pretty much specialize in producing substrates that deliver the highest sustainable characteristics. That could be paper, that could be board, that could be replacements to plastic that uh, in in materials that operate or behave as closely to plastic as possible, but that are still recyclable or level one curbside recyclable or compostable, the list goes on. So typically, and, and I've been sitting in sustainability for over 25 years. This has been my focus. This is my third paper mill um, that I've worked for, third or fourth. I've lost track on that side now, but all in all, I was 15 years on the print side too, as well as mailing. It's been a minute since I've been out of that, but in my day, um, we were, I worked for a printer that was second in the country to become FSC certified. So there was a heavy demand on us to find a way to make 100% post-consumer recycled substrates work. No one wanted to pay more, but they also didn't want to sacrifice any quality or any look of the piece. Didn't want to hear that that's because it's recycled. So here at Manadnock, we do not let the word recycled, environmental, sustainable become any kind of an excuse for not being able to deliver the most sustainable substrates to our print partners and the community. You do not have to compromise quality at Manadnock, and you do not need to compromise performance when it comes to sustainability. Um, that's a very deep topic. For those of you who are interested in how that's done, happy to field any questions or so on the side or afterwards. Um, please, you'll, you'll be given our contact information to reach out. But the hemp envy is but one of our grades. One of the things that's important to Monadnock is we call ourselves fiber agnostic. So we play in worlds of hemp, of cotton, um, various alternative fibers, eucalyptus, 100% um, post-consumer content, also virgin fiber and multiple combinations of fiber. We do that to guarantee that our, our, sub, our substrates deliver to you the highest performance metrics possible and to meet the needs of your application. And hemp NB happens to be one of the ways in which we're utilizing one of those alternative fiber supply chains. So in this case, Shamit had the ability to choose for multiple papers of ours to debut their campaign of kindness rather than a sales tactic that went out to the market at a very well-timed um, occasion. The hemp happened to be one of the ways in which they could debut our commitment to using multiple alternative fibers in the mix of their products that they're delivering to the market. Um, next slide. Andrew. Okay, we might be having technical difficulties there. <laughs> okay, here we go. There you go. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right. So again, what what this box was, and I'll let these ladies talk about it as they get into their portion of it. But this box that we uh, created for them was a 24 point. It happened to be a vellum surface or an eight, and we've done an 18 point. And this was, it did qualify as a hundred percent recycled logo because it, there was no virgin trees and no normal virgin fiber involved in it. It was purely made from uh, 30% hemp and the other 70% of the content was made in PC 100. So it was a really nice piece. It was a direct mail box rather than a letter you got in the mail. And it was one that was sent at a really sensitive time when people were really missing the touch of other folks. So they could have, you know, one of the things I admired about it, not just me, but I received back as feedback from the customers in the industry is they were really grateful to have gotten something that was a touch point that wasn't something that was just in, in an effort to sell a product or a service. And I would just add to that, Julie, you know, effective direct mail campaigns really choose the right target and the right message. As Julie mentioned, this particular campaign was the debut of Hemp Envy. And our goal there was to target the buyers and companies in which sustainability was important to them. Ones that we've had conversations with, ones that we knew that sustainability was in their core um, fundamentals of their business. So I think in order to have really a successful campaign, you need to know your ideal client profile. ICP is critical to a campaign that is effective. Also, in the beginning stages, I would get designers, marketing, and even the sales team involved. Getting these reps involved at concept is vital to the success of a campaign. Knowing who your audience is, why you're targeting them, does the message resonate with them? And think about things, these things in the beginning stages. It really is, like I said, crucial to the success of the campaign. Another thing to consider is budget. Now, you can save money in these beginning stages by getting the designer involved. Different formats, whether you send a letter, a flat, a postcard, or a dimensional piece, these all cost differently to produce and send through the United States Postal Service. I can't really speak to Canadian Post, but you know, for the US, that there's a variety of different costs there. Another thing that's crucial is I would get your mill rep and I would get um, your paper rep involved, also your print rep, to maximize that sheet. They all know the availability of the sheet. They'll know the size of your piece that you're trying to, to design, and they'll maximize the, um, the imposition on your sheet, therefore less waste too. Another way is in the United States, we have the USPS postal uh, promotional offers. And depending on the piece, depending on the timing, in postage, you can save anywhere from three to five percent, which allows you to reach out to more people, allows you to even use a stock that's a little bit more expensive. Um, and I would say lastly is making an experience. This particular direct mail piece that we did was interactive. It had the kind bar, which was memorable, but it also had staying power. And it allowed people to go back in and color the note card that we gave them or color the outer box. So it was more of an experience once they received that piece. Yeah, and you know, Stacey just brought up an important point. Um, when we speak about the importance of strategic partners, if we could summarize what she just said into that, there's several pieces of your supply chain and she just hit on them. Your merchant rep, your printer, your paper mill, you know, at the time Hemp Envy was debuted, we already had a luxury folding box board line that was made in, that is made and coated and uncoated, 100% post-consumer recycled. It was made for indigos. It was made for the digital world. It was made for the offset world. We tried to give the on market the best offering we could, coated versus uncoated, you know, to meet everyone's aesthetic needs. But one thing I want to say, which is really important, I think, here, because she talked about budget. <laughs> Everybody was very interested in hemp as an agricultural source and a fiber that they felt the paper mills should be taking advantage of and maximizing. So the timing at which this came out during COVID, that was a pretty hot topic in the market hemp. Not saying it's not today, but I think that what people have realized in the hemp, it's a great idea. We should be utilizing all sources that we have out there instead of depleting any one source. 
And let's face it, if there wasn't virgin fiber made from um, sustainably sourced FSC certified forests and materials, we'd have no recycled fiber. So we really do take that seriously as a paper mill and we try to leverage all assets. But just so people are aware in the audience, hemp, just because it's growing in so many places in an agricultural field, that agricultural fiber is not something that paper mills can actually harvest and take and use to produce the type of printing that you're printing sheet that you're seeing here today. It's not refined enough. So hemp is still new, and there are a few places in which you can buy enough as a paper mill to actually make a whole production run. So we're still living in a world of what we call industrial hemp as opposed to agricultural hemp. And until there's more pulping suppliers out there who actually take the hemp, harvest it, and make it into a form that's viable for paper mills and for printers alike to print on the sheet, then it's going to remain an expensive product in, in terms of a fiber until there's more sources for it out there in the market. So I think that that's just an important point that she brought up. And these are things you're not expected to know, but these are things that your spicers rep, that your mill rep, that you're uh, working with the printer that we get, as long as we're in on it all together with you arm in arm, then this is something that we can address ahead of time so that you don't go too far down a road to find out that it might not be viable for a particular customer or application. Um, so therefore, I can't stress the need for your alignment with strategic partners enough. Um, it's good to get everybody involved at the beginning so that we can help you. It's our job to be consultants as opposed to order takers. And this is something that we, we all on, at the merchant level, I'm sure Kristen would uh, agree to this as well. We pride ourselves in doing this. Any type of real business development, we should be creating value for you, with you. Um, so Stacy has talked about, sorry, I'm trying to follow two timelines here, but Stacy's talked about the inception um, and choosing the right message. And she shared some of what she experienced as a printer. And I put this out to probably 50 key brands you know, during the COVID pandemic and the response rate because of people sitting at home was massive, you know, and the comments that I got back was what a nice thing, what a kind thing. And that's exactly what they were trying to achieve. So I'm not sitting at Shamit looking at their results, you know, two years ago, what they achieved from this. I can't speak to that, but I can tell you the response that I got from my customer base and my customer base, our customer base at Manadnock, it ranges anything from the Patagonia types of companies, the retail companies of the world, like the Gaps, the American Eagles, you know, all the way up to the Michael Kors and the Tiffany's and the Estee Lauder space. So this was really appealing across the board to all of those verticals. Um, she's met, she's touched on designing for impact. Um, Kristen, did you want to speak a little bit on the messaging as we flip to the as we flip yeah. to the next is that slide. a next slide or yeah. this yep. slide? We're flipping. It might be a next slide. Mm -hmm. Yes, Andrew. It doesn't matter. I guess we'll talk about it. Can we go to the next slide or? Okay. 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 Pretty. See? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so positive messaging. I, I just love this part because we included the kind bar um, because it not only matched our grandparents' values, but we felt that kindness uh, to ourselves and others was especially needed uh, during the COVID lockdowns, as Julie had mentioned. So the intent behind this direct mail campaign was to provide a tangible, a real personal connection and to help alleviate that emotional toll of isolation during that really challenging time for all of us. So knowing how positive messaging can influence um, really empowers direct mail campaigns to be meaningful and to also harness the strength of optimism, uh, improving individuals' emotional well-being. So we always talk about this here, Chana, can a direct mail campaign you know, really do all that? And we believe it can. So um, when done thoughtfully and strategically, direct mail has the potential to convey those meaningful messages, uh, promote conversation, especially around sustainability, and to build those uh, long-standing relationships. Mm -hmm. I would just add to that that um, testing a message can be critical to the success of a campaign. I always say AV splits, um, you know, because you can go in, see if the message resonates with a small group of people, and it'll allow you to tweak it and then 
hit a larger group of people with a message that you feel resonates. Um, this particular campaign didn't use variable data, but personalization is a great way of um, increasing the messaging too, because you're making it more personal with the person. Uh, I would say keep it simple and memorable. By uh, we, this one, one, like I said, we incorporated um, in the kindness campaign was interactive. The recipient got that card that you see on the deck there that they were they could color it color it. It also came in a box that you could color too as well. Um, so with that, we created a story that was relatable, and the presentation was really beautiful. Don't forget delivering the smiles because you really did in this case. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, you know, we're bouncing around in our order, but it's all relevant here because I think what they're talking about is the human connection. And that really aligns well. I believe that they were highly successful simply by the feedback I got from my 50 of our customers. And um, that's pretty much what they said was the con. And you guys understand that. So I assume the audience is, especially in Canada, is well versed in sustainability. So you know that sustainability is not just about environmental metrics or uh, recycled content, it's about human metrics and social responsibility, people, profit, planets, and beyond. So this really hit all categories. And I think of this like a printer. When I was on the printing and mailing side, really unique approach because clearly people can see what kind of printer I am if I'm sending out this box and I don't need to tell them why they need to buy printing from me. They should be, it should be able to speak for itself, you know? And um, yeah, just really great job you guys did on all of this. And it was a really very good depiction of everybody, except in this case, Kristen, this is an odd one where the merchant wasn't involved here only because Shaman happens to be one of our test facilities in New England. So, you know, we, we test a lot of, she mentioned testing the market. We test a lot of our substrates there. Uh, they do a lot of testing to make sure that what they're maneuvering in with their mailing and their human touch points are actually reaching their intended audience. So this one was a really nice example of a collaboration. And that's really why we wanted to share this example with you today. Um, Andrew, you want to take us to our next slide? So we spoke about the timing and I'll, um, you know, there may be something that Shaman wants to add here too. So I'll flip it to them at the end. But this one, the timing was very good. The alignment was good for the uh, desire of alternative substrates. The only good thing I really saw, I shouldn't say the only, but one of the good things I saw come out of COVID was dramatic innovation. Innovation for our company and innovation for everybody out there. We all learned a new way. We're all sitting on a Teams meeting right now doing this presentation instead of needing to physically be there in person. And I'm not sure that we would have catapulted globally at this level where we're able to make these kinds of face-to-face -face connections in a virtual world had we not been forced into that innovation through COVID. Um, this is, I believe, the last, one of the last slides we have to share with you today because it's just a summary of when this dropped. And I'm sure sh the Shaman has done, you know, hundreds if not thousands of mailings since then, but we, re we picked this one for a reason. Um, you know, they, I'll let them speak to why they choose us as a partner, why they choose to use our type of substrates. They're a printer, they've got the ability to use and partner with anyone that they want to. But I would venture to guess that it has to do with sustainability and this connection. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you said it well. It's um, just like-minded people, you know, partner partnering with one another and becoming a community. And I think that's important as we move forward here. And also think it's a purposeful partnership. So there's an intent behind it. Like Julie said, it's a human connection. But I think that's really important as you, you can have all the metrics you want, but it really is at the end of the day, I think a connection. I mean, Kristen mentioned SGP. This isn't a plug for SGP, but she and I happen to both sit on that board. Vinadnock is the platinum supporting partner of SGP. There's a lot of SGP certified facilities in Canada. Um, I believe, Kristen, help me if I get this wrong, sgp.org, correct, for the website? You guys can look at the list of them. But these are companies, not that they're better one than the other, but these are companies that have gone far, far out of their way to um, achieve not just a check and a certification you get once a year, but on-site audits, consultative approaches. You know, they have multiple metrics to hit just to continue to be 
able to belong to that organization, let alone being a certified facility. So hopefully we're going to get to a takeaway slide here in a minute, your key takeaways. But hopefully if you didn't even learn anything else from us today, hopefully what you'll see here is that we can sell in many ways without having to sell. We can all further our businesses, and it should be by leading by example as opposed to by words. And that's something that both of our facilities I know are well aligned on and we're proud of. So, last slide, Andrew. I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So, here's your key takeaways from today. We have our power of partnerships. Hopefully, we covered that. The psychology of positive messaging and direct mail that you guys are able to reach out to these subject matter experts for, whether it be in this call today with questions or after the fact, and then creating emotional connections because those are the ones that are going to last. Um, people, in my experience, do business with you for a few reasons, one of which would be because they need what you have to offer, and one of which could be because they actually really want to engage and partner with you. And those are the ones that you typically build that yield themselves out of creating these emotional connections in which you actually deliver upon the commitments that you've set forth. Um, with that said, if Stacy and Kristen don't have anything additional to add, or either Kristen for that matter, Kristen, how about you on the Spicer side, your value partner of ours up there, is anything you're hearing today resonate for what you see or just over the border? Oh, you're on mute somehow. <laughs> mm, okay. Well, we can go to Q&A. Yeah, so if Andrew, if you want to turn it to the audience, if they want to add Kristen, are you fixed? No, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, no, needed to unmute myself. <clears throat> okay. No, 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 no. Our, 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 one of our one of our benefactors actually at one point in time produced a number of flashcards that people could end people up could. using that uh, would enable you to tell people that you're on mute or, or that you know the dog is barking or, or what have you. Um, we got a bunch of questions that, that kind of came in um, over time prior to the session. I have a few questions for, you know that that I mean I'll take the benefit of being on this panel asking them you know myself. Uh, so if I understand correctly, because I'm not 100% sure this got stated clearly at the beginning, but the premise of the campaign was really to generate goodwill, right? I mean, that's the whole premise. It was is that, um, you know, we're out of time, you know, paper was was scarce. Um, people were, you know, locked up in their houses. To a, to a great extent, um, generally the you know the, the the environment wasn't particularly good, um, and the whole premise behind this was that you folks were were looking to end up people you know making people feel better um, through the campaign, right? I mean that was the whole premise, and through that have a better impression of Manadnock as a company. Is that is that the the idea behind it, really? Um, actually, I'm going to defer to Shaman on that. Since this was okay. her, their campaign, I believe you're correct, but I'm going to let uh, yeah. Kristen and Stacy answer, because it was definitely their campaign, and we supplied the vehicle to get it to the market yeah. as a mill. Yeah, I mean, you said it well, Andrew. It was about goodwill. Uh, it was a time, I think, in not just you know, here locally, but around the whole world right. where no one had gone through this and it was new to all of us. So in this campaign, we felt that it wasn't a time to sell. It was a time really to spread kindness and empathy. And I think when you put your foot forward with empathy, you build strong relationships with that. And I think that's critical to any campaign. Good. I mean, it's a it's a really really neat concept, and I mean, I think it uh, uh, it, it it is you know definitely um, something that you know worthwhile of emu emulating and worthwhile um, you know focusing on. Um, I guess the next question kind of could both you know both be directed uh, at you folks at Shamit, but also at Manadnock. Um, so. When you're dealing with alternative fibers, whether it ends up being this particular case where you're using hemp, or I, I don't know whether in your lineup, whether there are any other alternative fibers that you folks use, um, are there special considerations that you need to end up taking care of when you're manufacturing this stuff on the Manadnock side? And then on the Shawmut side, are there any particular considerations that you think of um, that may be different when you're putting ink on the paper um, that somebody should be aware of? 
Um, I can answer first and then turn it to them as a printer to talk about what they experience on at least our substrates. And keeping in mind, I can only come at this from the monadnock angle. And the reason I, bring, I say that is even when you're dealing with recycled fiber, they're not all recycled fiber is the same. It's about where you get it from and what level or grade you buy. And there's often a price tag associated with that. But in my world, again, we are expected at Monadnock to produce multiple substrates that you do not have to compromise on performance in order to have sustainability. Whether that's hemp, cotton, eucalyptus, you name it, it doesn't matter. Or virgin fiber, they all need to look and basically perform all the same or very close to the same without compromise. So from our perspective, the only thing we look at is a paper mill that you need to keep in mind when you're using alternative substrates truly is availability. Availability of the actual raw material. And there can certainly be a budget or a price tag associated with that. And I mentioned that earlier on. Um, that's not me trying to scare the market saying you shouldn't use these things. But, you know, from a manufacturing side, when you're using 100% recycled or specifically various alternative fibers, sugarcane, um, bamboo, bagasse, ban banana fiber, I've made lots of them, I haven't, but my mills have over the years. Um, there are some considerations in terms of maximum thicknesses of substrate or minimum thicknesses that every fiber behaves a little differently is the better way I could say it. But in my world at Manadnock, no, there's not many restrictions on what we can run. We just go into the consideration if somebody wants a 30 point, for example, board, and they want it to be single ply, that may not be possible with the way alternative fiber behaves slightly different than regular tree fiber. But the limitations from a mill side are very, very small. What do you think, Stacy? Yeah, print? I mean, we, we print on a lot of um, recycled paper here. I have to say, Manadnock is the best. We print it on every single press we have. We have uh, 40 inch Camoris, uh, Perfectors, UVs, conventional. We have uh, HP Indigos. We print on our wide format division too, as well. And uh, it prints beautifully. I can't say enough about it. Thanks. <laughs> That's always good to hear. We didn't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> So um, I've just, I, I just see a couple more questions that kind of came across unless anybody, you know, on our, on our list of attendees has something that they want to ask. I know that we have some folks in the paper world who are on this call, so you know, perhaps they might want to ask some questions, but um, just looking at it from the point of view of where we are right now um, in terms of you know the present status um, of paper availability and and you know demands and whatnot. You know, are there any components to this campaign that you feel um, might um, uh, uh, shine above and beyond? Um, you know what what was initially the intent, both from a from a material perspective, but from an intent perspective, um, in kind of this post pandemic situation that we find ourselves. I kind of throw that question out to everybody. I mean, you know, the folks at Shamut, the, the folks at Monadnock and the folks at Spicers, right? I mean, you know, if, if you were to highlight, you know, how would you go about highlighting it and what transcends the time frame? What transcends, you know, the, the pre-pandemic or pandemic period into the post-pandemic kind of situation? Um, for the vapor mill side, really it hasn't changed for us. The, I mean, the one innovation that I am constantly seeing post pandemic now, that clearly the pandemic played a very large role as a catalyst in, in putting forward is sustainability. I mentioned I've been selling that 25 years. I worked for a mill that was the first to make the 100% post consumer recycled decades and decades ago for the American market. And one thing that I've, I've never seen the desire and the crave for sustainability and sensitivity to climate change as high as it is right now. So that's something I've seen come out of the pandemic. I've seen massive constituent uh, requests at, at a very high brain level for, uh, for each, she mentioned wide format. Everybody wants to replace single use plastic. Um, however, everyone knows that fiber or paper typically absorbs water and doesn't do well in those environments. So our innovation has been deep and heavy for the last 10 years, especially, but in the last three years, it's the market seems to have an obsession 
with the desires of innovation. They're having us create products that are as close to waterproof as possible. Some are highly water resistant. Some can sit in water for more than 24 hours without coming apart or bounce right back into the form they started with once you take them out of the paper. So there's tremendous innovation, I could say, from the paper side post-pandemic that has everything to do with the replacement of plastics um, and styrenes in the market. Stacy, I, I don't know, I mean, kindness tends to supersede before pandemic and during pandemic, after pandemic. But if you want to share from your side, maybe Kristen from Spicers, if her audio is working now, can tell us, you know, what she's seeing up there in, in Canada. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I said it. <laughs> Um, I think the collaboration and partnership between all levels of the mills, as well as the printers, as well as us as a merchant, is crucial today, just as much as it was during the pandemic. I think it really created a great foundation to get all the information across and make sure that we worked within a certain timeline um, to get a message into industry, into our clients' hands. So I think just partnerships is still applicable. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that, and I would agree with creating a community within those clients, vendors, partners. I think that's crucial, you know, and kindness will come out of that because you surround yourself by people that are like-minded, uh, only good things can come out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that pretty well gets us through the, the entire list of questions, unless we kind of get something, something coming through. Um, Thank you very much for having participated in this. Uh, Kristen, Julie, um, the folks at Shamut, thank you very much for for, for making uh, I just have a quick set of points that I want to you know go through before we call it a day. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, the session has been recorded and that video will be posted to our YouTube channel in the coming days. The links that you see in the chat, if you haven't copied them over right now, um, they will be posted in the description on the YouTube channel. Uh, if you did the event, please share that video with your colleagues. Um, and as I mentioned before, if you want to stay on top of our content, um, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell so that you'll be reminded of any new content that gets posted. And finally, I encourage everybody to um, become a member of the SMG. Um, as a result of that, it helps us you know, provide um, more content to the community um, and um, engage with a, a broader and a more diverse group of stakeholders. Uh, stay tuned. As I mentioned, uh, this is the first of one of many sessions that we plan on hosting in conjunction with our sponsors, but we will be hosting other sessions in the coming weeks um, as well um, on, in other areas. So stay tuned. Uh, make sure that you end up subscribing to our, to our email lists. Um, and thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have yourselves a great afternoon and uh, have a great week.